I just want to have one last pass across this comparing insides and outsides thing. But I want to see if I can loop around to catch the, uh, the book that's being discussed on the reading group right now, which is Morris Berman's Coming to the Senses. I'm not sure if I'll get there, but I'll try it. Because what I'm interested in is this uh, disjunction between and the effects of this disjunction we have when, uh, you know, following the lines of that aphorism, don't compare your insides to something outside, when we uh, take the appearance of someone else as a kind of template for our own sudden sense of self. Because our own sense of self isn't really our appearance, at least most of it isn't. I think there are some kinesthetic image stuff, image schematic stuff, that is a very close correlation to an appearance. But most of the thing that, we, that, that it is to be alive and awake, and you know, all the things that we're seeing and hearing and tasting and touching and all the emotional, somatic, sensory stuff that's going on in our bodies, all that kind of stuff, isn't visible. Nobody else can see that, and we can't see it in anybody else. So when we look at another person, all that stuff is, is, is discarded, and we just see their visual appearance. So we're not comparing like with like. Uh, uh, and, and that aphorism about uh, not comparing insides and outsides is usually, uh, well, it's usually only referred to in a kind of therapeutic or a, yeah, in that kind of context, really, because it's assumed that that if you are making those kind of comparisons, that you're uh, you're feeling negative about yourself as a result. So you feel yourself lacking when you look at how together someone else is compared to your in internal sense of not togetherness. But it's still a mistake, even if you're not, um, well, there's still an error there, I should say. If, even if there is no um, uh, kind of negative connotations or no emotional upsets resulting from that, uh, even if I'm feeling fantastic and together and really confident and comfortable and, um, you know, and, and having a sense of supreme mastery of my world, even if I'm in that state and I look at someone else and compare how I'm feeling to what they look like, I'm still making a mistake. Uh, and if by chance they are feeling the same way as me, it's, it's coincidence, not, uh, not because there is a real correlate, uh, correlate there. Uh, because it's the same uh, not comparing like with like thing going on. So what's the... I think two things possibly come out of that. I think one of them may lead into this Morris Berman stuff. Uh, Assuming, and this was a big assumption, assuming that, uh, that that situation of not comparing like with like is something that we'd want to be avoid, that we would want to compare like with like, perhaps because more authentic communication can take place or because we feel more, uh, I don't know, who knows. But let's assume for a minute that we do want to have a more genuinely uh, truthful kind of engagement. It seems to me there's two ways to go. Uh, we can either compare our insides to someone else's insides. Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah, I think to do that, you would have to deploy certain strategies. You would have to uh, develop empathy. You would have to develop sympathy. You would have to uh, engage in kind of some kind of intimate practices. You would have to get close to that person. You might have to talk to that person and find ways of uh, accessing their internal state through language. You might have to touch them and get, you know, collapse the visual into the, into the haptic, you know, so you're giving them a hug or something like that. Um, yeah, I think you'd have to, yeah, you'd have to access their insides so that your insides and their outsides were in a more uh, copacetic relationship. Uh, the alternative would be to try to compare your outsides to their outsides, which means that rather than identifying with your insides, uh, some of which may well correspond to your visual appearance, but most of which wouldn't, rather than focusing on all that, you would try to identify very strongly with your own appearance as you imagine it to be, or more accurately, your own appearance as you imagine other people to see it. So you would start to, to feel yourself moving into an image. Uh, I think I'm right in saying this is what Lacan, the psychoanalyst, refers to as the mirror stage in, um, in child development. He's talked about kids looking themselves in mirrors. 
And there's a certain stage between the ages of two and three, I think it is, where they start to recognise themselves in the mirror. You know, it's just fine, and a few other animals do that as well. But what Lacan says is that that recognition isn't just a recognition, it isn't just a sense of, oh, that's me, there, look, you know. There's also a misrecognition going on there. Because what the image lacks is all that somatosensory stuff, all that uh, proprioceptive stuff, all the stuff to do with how that person feels, what they taste like, you know, what, what kind of taste they've got in their mouth, what pleasures and pains are going across their sensory nervous system. All that stuff is lacking from the mirror, mirror image. So an identification with that mirror image is a misrecognition and carries all this lack. Uh, and I think that's what Maurice Berman's getting at as well when he talks about this fault or this Nemo. I don't know why he calls it a Nemo, but uh, this uh, this idea that you, in order to become a person in some some ways, you kind of abandon lots of stuff going on inside yourself and uh, identify yourself with how you imagine yourself to look to other people or how you imagine you look in a mirror. So uh, you are trying to compare like with like. You're comparing, you're trying to compare your part of yourself to someone else's outside. So you uh, construct an outside to compare it to, even though it's based, as I say, on misrecognition and lack. <laughs>